Bars, Steven. Good morning. How are y'all doing? Hey. What's up, guys? Yeah, good morning. Good to be here with you guys. I know it's it's Friday. It's finally a little bit cooler here in Austin. It was it was like in the 80s the last couple of weeks. I'm enjoying the the colder weather, but um yeah, we're we're really excited to have you. Yeah, it's good to be here, man. I've been uh following your podcast and your work and conversations and uh you know, appreciate the work you're doing to elevate the conversations in the space. So, this is uh, you know, like like to see our worlds worlds colliding here. Agreed yeah, likewise. Well, I- I got to admit, I'm a little nervous, Lars. You are, you're a bit of a rock star in what we do in our space. So for the audience, our audience out there that's not familiar with Lars, check him out. He's, he's done a lot of work. And honestly, part of the reason why guys like Daniel and I can like do this and have a show like the Modern People Leaders because of the pioneers ahead of us like Lars that have done the things you've done. So I'm just putting that out there. If I, if I stumble on my words a little bit, I'm, I'm a little nervous for this one. But excited. Oh, no. Well, that's that's kind, uh, but don't be. We're gonna have fun just riffing <laughs> on uh, topics we care about. So it's all good. Awesome. Well, let's get into good news stories. So every episode, we we start by sharing a personal or work related story from the past week or two. And um, you know what? I will. I'll go, and I'm gonna build off of what Stephen just said. So this episode will go out in January, but this is our last episode that we're recording for 2022. And I couldn't think of a better guest to have on for our final episode of the year. It's not often that we get to connect with other podcasters that are talking about some of the same topics and have very similar. There's, I'm sure there's a lot of overlap in our community. So um, it's just, I think this is going to be fun. We, We haven't talked to anybody like you on the show and I'm excited to have you here. Cool. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm stoked to be here, and I think we'll have a lot to cover. Right, this will be uh, you know, th- this will be like one of those podcasts that could run like Joe Rogan style, only in length. I'm talking about length here, but uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> who wants to go next? Good news, good news. So we've been doing this is our third recording, and Daniel mentioned it in our last our last show that uh, it's hard to think of good news when you're doing so many back to back podcasts. So my good news is. This weekend is like the quiet before the storm. So I don't have my daughters this weekend. We don't have family. We, we've had something going on for like a month. And so it's going to be nice to get a little downtime this weekend before like all the holiday craziness picks up. So I'm going to take that. Yeah, I can I can appreciate that uh, that sentiment of that cherished calm that is not always easy to uh, to obtain. Um, yeah, I think for me, uh, really the good news this week, since I launched Amplify Academy, which I'm sure we'll get into, one of the things that I've always known I've wanted to do is to create diversity council within it and really try to use the the platform to create more access to learning and leadership development for practitioners, and emerging leaders from underrepresented communities. And we finally done that. So we announced the uh, diversity council last week. We have 11 founding members. And then this week we launched the pilot a scholarship program for the upcoming golf cohort. So we'll be holding three scholarships for every cohort moving forward. And so really excited about that. Uh, application process will run through the end of this month. Uh, well, this will run in January. It will run through the end of December, but really excited for that to finally come to life and uh, just excited to see where the diversity council takes it. Well, congratulations. That's uh, that's really exciting. So I'm, I'm sure that a good portion of our audience has either seen you on LinkedIn or listened to a podcast of yours. Can you can you talk us through the origin story for Amplify Talent and everything else that you have going on? I think that uh, you know when we we talked to you a couple of weeks ago or a month ago, however long ago it was, I personally really related to your story. I feel like there's a lot of parallels between your story and and me and Steven. So um, yeah, if you could share that story with us, I think that would be that'd be great. Yeah, I mean, so I I had spent um, a little over twenty years in the space. You know, most of that was in the corporate side. So I ran global recruiting and talent teams for uh, Ticketmaster, um, an open source e-commerce company called Magento, and uh, NPR uh, most recently. And nine years ago, it's, it feels weird to say that out loud, but nine years ago, I left NPR to start my own firm. Flies. I know, right? It's uh, it's it's you know, it it goes quickly, and I think you know, Amplify has evolved over that time. So I I launched it, um, you know, originally I created it where we live in uh, you know, Northern Virginia outside of DC, and um, I wanted to be able to work with clients around the world, and so launching my own business, you know, allowed 
uh, that to happen. And so initially it was focused on mostly consulting, typically in the areas of like employer brand and recruiting optimization. Then it evolved into creating an HR executive search practice. And then now it's evolved into, uh, there's two components now. I don't do consulting anymore. Now it's HR executive search and then the Amplify Academy. And kind of the origin story there, um, you know, I've always had an editorial component to what I do. So when I was at NPR, I started blogging and um, you know, I'm by no means a, a prolific writer. So for me, I was like, let me just write about what we're doing, right? And kind of embracing open source. So we were, you know, we went all in on employer brand as a strategy at NPR back in the early days of employer brand. And so, you know, much of what was happening was all new and we were all learning from each other. And so a lot of my writing was just, hey, here's how we're using Twitter for this campaign. Here's how we collaborated on this other thing. Here's what went well. Here's what we screwed up. And if you try to do this, like don't do these things. And so that was kind of the start of the writing and that led to, uh, you know, writing for publications like LinkedIn and Sherm, which led ultimately to writing for Forbes, which, you know, at that point, kind of my bucket list um, writing destination was Fast Company. And so I, I ended up getting an introduction to an editor there and kind of the way that they work at the time was like, you know, if you want to write for them, you submit an original complete piece. And if they like it, they'll run it. If they don't, they'll reject it. And so I submitted the piece that got rejected. I submitted another piece that got rejected. I submitted another piece that got rejected. And I then followed up the editor. I was like, hey, look, I'm going to keep going until you tell me to stop or something gets accepted. And he was like, no, keep writing. And by the fifth piece, I finally got in. And then, you know, after five stories, you get, you know, a byline. And so then I had a regular column. And so when I had the regular column in Fast Company, uh, I was doing, I want to do a year long series called 21st Century HR where I basically would take my column in for the entire year, focus on kind of shining a spotlight on emerging and progressive HR and people practices. And so I launched that and then I wanted to be able to go deeper because most fast company pieces, you have about a thousand words to work with. And so I created the podcast, which was originally 21st century HR to be an accompanying media piece to my fast company series. So that when I was writing a story, I could also interview people about that story and do a podcast on it. So if a reader wanted to go deeper, they wanted digital context, they could listen to the podcast. And so that's really how the podcast got started. You know, from the moment I was like, hey, maybe it would be cool to also do a podcast, to actually having it published and syndicated was probably less than 24 hours. It was just like, okay, we'll do this. And so I, you know, created that. And, the, you know, the Fast Company piece was usually every other month. Um, I decided I wanted to do more podcast. So then the podcast ended up becoming its own thing. And then, you know, a couple of years before I had co-authored employer branding for dummies, uh, I started working on my second book, redefining HR. And when that launched, I rebranded 21st century HR, the podcast to redefining HR. So they would all be kind of consistent. And then actually just last week or last month, I announced that redefining HR starting in the upcoming ninth season in January will become redefining work because I want to, I want to zoom out a bit. I mean, we're still going to cover conversations with chief people officers and CHROs, but I also want to zoom out because I think that the when you think about this new world of work that we're building, um, HR is a huge driver of that. But we're not the only driver. There are other, you know, constituent CEOs, etc., that are impacting what we do. Uh, and so I want to be able to tell more of those types of stories as well. And so that's kind of the, you know, the evolution of of all the platforms. Wow, that that's a lot. You're uh, the, hearing your story about getting rejected and rejected. It sounds a lot like my entrepreneurial career, honestly. <laughs> and one of the things that I I have uh, kind of picked up on, in you know, it's I want to definitely go go deeper into this is just around the shifts and changes in the HR community over the period that you you just walked us through and more recently like the last couple of years and in my experience it has felt as though hr programs policy information process information it would you know companies would hold on to to these details like they were state secrets like they they you you can't share this information or we're going to lose our comparative advantage and we recently had Kelly Keegan from Built In on the show and she mentioned that it's been a beautiful thing that out of the pandemic there's been an open sourcing of HR to use her words in terms of the thought leadership and just sharing 
playbooks and details and best practices. And and for me, I think that there's still a little bit of that mindset with, with some companies and certain industries, but there's definitely been a shift in our community. When do you think this movement started? I don't think it started with the pandemic, just like all of the other things that came out of the pandemic. I feel like this was already happening. The pandemic just gave the opportunity to really lean into it. Yeah, I mean, I, so I, I certainly agree that uh, it started before the pandemic. It certainly gained momentum during the pandemic. I mean, I probably go back to 2015. Um, 2015, you know, for so at that time for the field, and you're right, I think the field of HR has typically been, you know, the legacy mindset there is being a gatekeeper, having kind of siloed approaches where you view your practices as trade secrets. You know, we, we've had this notion of the war for talent beaten in our heads for uh, decades at this point, right? And so I, I think a lot of people did carry that. I think in 2015, we saw a turning point and, and a couple of things happened in that year. So my my friend Ambrosia Vertesi and I co-founded HR Open Source. That was one, I think, big catalyst. And it grew into a movement of over 10,000 people from over hundred countries coalescing around the idea of open practices and sharing and sharing templates and sharing resources and sharing of failures. That same year, Google launched their rework platform, which was mm -hmm. their open source platform. And so, you know, obviously they, they wanted to help people learn how they make more data-driven HR and people processes and decisions. And, you know, Laszlo was a big driver of that. And so I think that those two initiatives, and certainly there were elements of open source prior to those things, but I think those were probably two of the first big global efforts to really move the field towards open practices and the momentum continued to build from there. And so, yeah, it was interesting. I think when you kind of mentioned sharing and open practices, like when I, uh, when redefining HR came out, I got a lot of feedback from the book. I mean, I really wrote that to kind of be a blueprint for modern HR with a lot of case studies and, you know, centering other practitioners and their work. So it was tangible and real. Like I didn't want to write an analyst's take or a pundit's take on the field of HR. Cause I think often those, that, that framing tends to be disconnected with the, the in the trenches reality that HR practitioners are facing. So it's like, yeah, in a perfect world, it'd be great to do that. But like, this isn't that. And so I think by creating case studies, and again, I kind of leveraged how we approach case studies at HR open source towards the book. And then, you know, as people were reading the book and giving feedback and so they wanted to continue their learning and kind of go deeper. Where could they go next? I really didn't have anywhere to send them that I felt comfortable sending them. And so that's actually how the Amplify Academy got created. It was it was based on having to find more. And obviously, the you know the academy is a subscription model, but there's definitely an open source component to it, and there always will be, where we can find ways to understand what the industry needs and try to meet that need through templates or amplifying. I mean, now there's so many platforms out there, companies out there that are just doing amazing work, sharing templates and open practices. So, you know, whereas back in 2015, we were having to create a lot of that work for the first time and also amplify it. Now there's so many people and companies and organizations that are creating that content. We can also create some content, but also really lean into amplifying that great content that's being created. And so in that sense, it's such a, it's an amazing time for the field, because even if you're an HR department of one in Des Moines or Manchester or Singapore, you still have access to so many great high value resources that can help you elevate your impact. Yeah. I, I feel like to a certain extent, this is starting to happen in other industries as well. So I'm a marketer and I feel like up until probably a couple of years ago, nobody was really sharing what was working and what wasn't working with their marketing programs either. And everyone was more or less doing the exact same thing with mediocre results. And I feel like it wasn't until LinkedIn, I feel like that's also contributed to the change, but it, it feels like people are more willing and open to, to share what they're learning across their team, what's working, what's not working. And um, yeah, it's just, it's just great to see. I feel like you know, across the the world of work, this is happening everywhere, and it's it's elevating the work that everybody's doing, not just HR. So, um, kudos kudos to to you know in 2015 starting HR open source because I I think that it's it's made a big impact. 
Yeah, I mean, look, I, and I think you're right. It, we are seeing it in other industries as well. And and the reality is, like, we we have to get out. I, I think that those that legacy mindset came from a place of zero sum, right? You know, for for us as an organization to win, everyone else has to lose. And like, yes, as it relates to hiring an individual, oh, sure, right? They're going to pick one company to work for. So the companies that they're interviewing with that they don't select, you could argue, okay, fine. In that individual case, outside of that. None of this is zero sum. We can all win. We can all do better. We can all elevate our capabilities. And we do that by, by collaborating, by celebrating each other, by sharing. And so, yeah, like I think that legacy mindset still exists in some pockets, but that's the way of the past. The way forward is open practices, open source, collaboration, building in public. And so, yeah, I, I, I applaud all the companies. Now there are many of them, you know, in organizations that are really leading the way there. Yeah, I I believe that part of it was also related to th this notion that as practitioners and professionals that we're going to work uh, at one or two companies for the rest of our lives. And I think that has completely been shattered. Over, like Now you can't stop the this, it, this movement, in, in my opinion, because there are so many people that are leaving their jobs, seeking new roles, seeking to do different things. And, and there's so much more freedom in, in what we can do as practitioners. When I started in 2000, I remember, you know, having the real realization and, and I, I was young and I'm just being honest here, but I remember thinking like, wow, is this what I'm going to be doing? You know, this specific thing in HR for the rest of my life, for my career, because that is what was, you know, that was what was verbalized to me. That's what I was told. Like, hey, you're going to do this and you're going to, you know, take on more responsibility and you'll get to this next promotion. And then you're going to do more of the same, you know, similar things, maybe a couple of different things. And you're going to manage people that are also doing the same things. And, and now the, the workplace is so different for HR practitioners. And I feel like there's so much more fluidity and, and people like, like ourselves that are, are wanting something different, wanting to, to make an impact in a different way. And, and so I'm just grateful that, you know, we, the, the world has moved on from where we were 20 years ago to where companies, you know, thought and had this belief that you know, we would stay with them for the rest of our lives. And, and I think that has created its empowerment in ways that are, are going to deliver so much value in, in, in probably in ways that we, we can't even imagine yet. Yeah. I mean, look, look at the field of HR, right? Like 20 years ago, you're talking about getting into it. Uh, it was an insular field, right? People came in at an associate level. They worked their way up. Like career progression was linear. It was vertical. And, and you know, so oftentimes you, you rarely, you know, the deeply held perspective in HR was a very HR perspective. And what I mean by that is like, it was people who grew up in the field and they'd spent their whole careers doing that. Look at the field today. And it's very different. People are moving in and out of HR. People are moving up in HR, moving into the business, moving back into HR. We're seeing CPOs come in from the business, right? And bringing that different business acumen. We're hiring data scientists and marketers. And HR is actually a destination function now where it's drawing people from other disciplines in. And it's really accelerated our capability. It's accelerated our innovation uh, the way we work and the way we think. So it's, uh, you know, it's very much not an insular field anymore and we're so much better for that. So yeah, it's, it's so, it's been so cool to watch that evolution. Uh, you know, and then now again, just seeing the, the roster of talent that we have access to in this field that 20 years ago, we would have had no shot of bringing somebody from that team or this team, you know, and now people are moving in and out all the time. So it's, uh, yeah, it's really, accelerated our our capability and our impact but also our, our our mindset you know we have less obstructed views because we have different perspectives and thinking uh reflected within our organization where do you think there's still pockets of opportunity in the function to I mean, to continue to disrupt and continue to like make more progress in terms of sharing and uh and thought leadership yeah, I mean, I think everywhere, right? Like, I don't, I don't think any function <laughs> or area is like has hit that maturity peak where it's like, yeah, 
can't get any better than that. Like we can always get better. Like I think, you know, areas that certainly still have a ways to go, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. I think there are some organizations that are quite progressive there, many that aren't and need to be. And so that piece is there, you know, recruiting, right? The way we recruit today is fundamentally no different than how we recruited 30 years ago, right? We had a job description, we had a resume, we had a human making the connection between those. We had a hiring manager expecting somebody to walk in the door with all of the experience required to be productive on day one. And, you know, yes, we used to fax those applications and those resumes, and now we do it online, but the process itself fundamentally hasn't changed. And that's starting to change as we start to move more towards skill-based hiring and development as opposed to role-based, but we're still in the early days there. So, I mean, that piece is, is certainly still there, you know, optimizing remote work and thinking about synchronous versus asynchronous work at scale. That's still a pretty new conversation for the field of HR that we certainly haven't uh, nailed yet. And the idea of employee experience and culture in remote and hybrid environments, how do we optimize that and do it equitably, right? Like there, there's a new set of problems and challenges, I think, that we're thinking about now than we were thinking about, frankly, even five years ago. And those decisions and those conversations really impact all aspects of the HR spectrum, if you will. So yeah, I don't think we're, we're, we're never going to be there. You know, it's kind of like one of those things where like when you're on a path towards evolution and iteration, there's not a finish line, right? And much like, you know, the, I drew the analogy for diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging work, right? If you're, if you're committed to that work, you're committed to that work for the long term. There's no destination. You don't get to a point and be like, yep, we're good. We, we, we've, we've done everything we need to do. There's always room to grow and develop. And I think when you look at a field that's evolving as rapidly as ours, very much the case uh, as well. So, Do you think that the, I guess, rapid evolution of work the last four or five years has contributed to HR becoming more of a talent destination for people? Um, I do. I mean, and, but let's also be honest about it. Like the work is, is also really hard, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So yes, it can be incredibly satisfying and gratifying, but also incredibly difficult and emotional and taxing. And so, you know, there's aspects of that that certainly are attractive to people who want to solve problems, people who want to have a lasting impact on building something new on, on something that touches the entire workforce, right? So that, that is, I think a draw for employees for sure, but they have to come in eyes wide open with like, yes, there are those opportunities and those are great and you can have a significant impact. But there are there is the other side of that, depending on where you work in HR, where burnout levels are high, the emotional toll is very high. Um, you know, if you work in tech and you're watching this, you know, you've seen round after round of layoff lists coming out. And so the, the stability factor is also a question and that other departments are impacted well. That's not just HR, um, but HR has the unique uh, role in that where they're often the group that is actually, for lack of a better word, and this isn't a, a great word, executing the layoffs and the rifts because they're they're oftentimes the ones kind of responsible for coordinating that, you know, even at times and that impacts their own roles as well, which we've seen many times, you know, in late uh, 2022, when you see these announcements of CPOs who are themselves perhaps being impacted by risk, but they're still saying, hey, you know what, I've got an amazing team, hire them, let me let me hype up all these different people on my team who are impacted, you know, and thinking about them first. So um, yeah, so I, I, th I think that, that there is a draw, but I think we have to, you know, make sure it's balanced and that they understand both the pros and the cons of the work and they come in with eyes wide open. Yeah, it's it's definitely a tough role. And as someone that was that was recently impacted by a riff and having that, you know, conversation with with the head of HR where they're walking me through the logistics of what's going to happen next, the details of severance and all of that stuff, I could just see the the pain on her face during that conversation. So, I I know that it's not always the the easiest job and it can be very emotional and like you said taxing. But I, I do think that there are a lot of elements to it that are rewarding and exciting. And just personally speaking, I've never I've never worked in HR, but I've been in the HR tech space for, for a while. And I think that the moment I realized that I wanted to to double down on on you know HR or you know working in the space in some capacity was probably like March, April of 2020, when I I had this epiphany, you know things are going to drastically change over the next few years and it's going to be 
largely the people function that's looked to to figure out what the next evolution of work looks like. And to your point, obviously, there are other people that are going to be driving this, but that's that's an exciting proposition for somebody that maybe works in a different part of the business and wants to be a part of the solution, wants to be a part of figuring out what that looks like. So yeah, um, it's changed you, so much in the last few years. I, I don't even know what works and look like in 10 years. And that's exciting to me, honestly. Yeah. Well, and kind is. of on that, on that point and to expand on that a little bit, Lars, do you think the lay HR person, or I guess the tenured HR person fully understands how much things are changing or will change? I, I think they do. And before I even answer that, like, Daniel, let me just send you some, uh, you know, love. Sorry to hear about the layoffs and that you had to experience that. I know that's, uh, you know, a hard thing to experience, you know, and unfortunately a lot of people are in that same boat right now. So just wanted to, you know, just kind of acknowledge that. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll talk offline about, you know, any yeah, ways that I appreciate can support. it. Um, but yeah, I think, I think, you know, the, the average person knows because they feel it. Right. And, and mm -hmm. I think also going back to that point around open source, you might be in, in what I would frame as a more legacy uh, company, right? Like maybe you have more transactional HR, it's more focused on payroll, those kind of things. You know, in the past, if you're in that organization and, you know, you're probably, your team probably is advocating you for self-development and training and, uh, and that sort of thing. And so if you're not surrounded by any of that, if you don't have peer networks where people are having those kind of conversations, you're just... You're just going, you're just doing the same thing that you always do. And I think in today's world, even for people in those environments, there's so many peer communities, there's so many open source projects and tools. You can see the conversations happening on LinkedIn on a daily basis, right? Like, even if you don't know based on the four walls around you, metaphorically speaking, you have the ability to easily plug into these other conversations that are taking place around how the world of work is, is changing. And so, yeah, I, I don't, I don't think anybody in HR is not cognizant on some level that the world of work today is very different than the world of work in, you know, February of 2020. And we're never going back to that exact place. Things will change and they'll continue to evolve. We'll have the conversations around in office, remote, whatever. Yes, that'll that'll carry on. But you know that that world of work, those norms, those expectations, those are gone forever. And so uh, you know we're in a position where we have to adapt. And in some organizations, we're going to do it faster than others. In other organizations, we're going to have to pull them along because maybe they're not uh, as you know keen on change. But no doubt, I think practitioners understand that this is a different world of work that we're in right now. Yeah, I think the my oh shit moment, like where I I I my mind was blown was was in a conversation on this podcast with Darren Murph. And when I heard what companies like GitLab are doing and the way that they're architecting, re-architecting the way that a company works, like fundamentally, there's so many components. And I get that that's one specific industry with one specific way of doing things, but I, I, that's what really opened my eyes. And since then, we've had dozens of conversations where I'm just like, oh, wow. Like I, I'm just, again, grateful that we get to have these conversations, but I, I've got to feel like there are HR professionals out there that are concerned. Like, how do I keep up with all these things and do this job that we just talked about is never ending? You know, it's, can be thankless. It's been super particularly stressful the last couple of years. So how do I keep up with all of these changes, understand kind of like what, where, you know, what advice would you give that, that HR professional? Yeah. I mean, look, I think, uh, you know, Darren is amazing and they've been a leader, both obviously in remote work, but I think also open source, they've been sharing what they're doing and how they're doing it and why they're doing it four years, right? So again, going back to that like 2015 analogy, GitLab is there too. They were one of the pioneers in really open practices and kind of how they were building what they were building. Um, I think when you look at HR today and this statement, the statement probably transcends HR, but obviously I'm going to kind of stay in my lane that this is the, the world that I, I spend my time in. There are two things that I think are the most important things um, for any practitioner 
to prioritize their career around, especially now. One is learning agility and the other is network equity. And I'll hit network equity first. I mean, that, that's really being very deliberate and intentional around how you build your network. Because ultimately, the value you bring to your role is not just the experience uh, and the knowledge you possess in your head. It's the experience and knowledge that you have access to. And like everybody has access to Google, sure. But if you're tasked with a problem at work that you've never done, but because you've been very proactive and conscious around building a robust network, particularly of people who have skills unlike yours, you now have you know two or three people you can call and be like, hey, I just got asked to do this. I've never done this. I have no idea where to start. I know you have. How did you do it? What you know, uh, landmines are, or should we be looking out for? Uh, do you have any templates you use when you did this? We could maybe borrow, right? Like when you have access to that beyond just the knowledge in your head, you bring so much more value to your employer and ultimately your own career. And so that's the network equity piece. The learning agility piece, you know, to your point, we're in such dynamic times right now. Things continue to evolve at a rapid pace. And if we don't make time for learning, if we don't prioritize that, it's going to pass us by. We're going to, we're going to be, we're going to be find ourselves lost in a few years. And so if you want a lasting career in HR, you've got to prioritize your network equity and you've got to prioritize your learning agility. And whether that is like, booking an hour in your calendar every week. That's your learning time. And that's when you kind of read those articles that your friends forward you that you saw on LinkedIn, you listen to that podcast, uh, whatever it might be, like have that time in your calendar and defend it because we're always going to have things to do. You'll always find excuses and work that will pull you away from doing those things that benefit you. But I think, you know, in 2023, we have to be more selfish about our own development from both a learning and a network and community standpoint. And if we do those things, we're actually bringing more value to ourselves and our own career, but we're also bringing more value to our employers because we have more access to more information and we understand things in a different way, access to more people whose experience we can leverage. So, you know, I, I think I would love to see more employers actually mandate their employees do that because it does bring value to them as well but many don't and won't. So it's on us, but we have to take responsibility for that. And, and I think that's really the key uh, for us in 2023 and beyond, because, you know, we're, I don't think we're ever going back to like static, predictable times, right? That's just not our world anymore. And we, we have to adapt Agreed. to how we keep up with that. Yeah. Uh, we recently had, I think Stephen mentioned this, we had Kelly Keegan from Built In on, and she was talking about how, in the world of, of HR the last couple of years, it's been, everything's been very reactive and we need to be more proactive. And it's because we've been putting out fires constantly, right? And um, one thing you mentioned was having learning agility and always being up to date on, on what's coming next. So I, I'm just curious, what, you know, have you had any recent conversations with with guests from the last few months where they said something like, oh, wow, this person is really ahead of the game and I hadn't even thought about that? Like, is there anything that, that comes to mind for you? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, in talking to to chief people officers and on the podcast, like a lot of them, they all talk about uh, network equity and the importance of peer networks. And I think as a CPO, especially, you have to have peer networks. You have to have phone of friends. You have to have people. Because again, that's a very lonely and isolating job. And you're dealing with shit that you can't really talk about to your team, to your executive peers, right? You you have to have that peer network that you can come to and like and lean on, right? For advice and sometimes for a shoulder and support when you're dealing with the hard things that you have to deal with in that role. I think from a learning perspective, really the what, what's interesting to me is is all you know, a question I often ask is around learning through the lens of business acumen, right? Because I think in HR, that's typically a skill that isn't traditionally thought of as like part of the HR toolkit. So whatever discipline you came up from, you know, oftentimes you're functionally strong. You have that subject mastery of comp and benefits or employee experience or whatever, but being able to connect that to the business and understand the business and understand how your work impacts the business and enables the business to achieve its goals. 
those are really important things. And that through line is rarely connected for us, unless you've worked for great leaders who've really um, reinforced that. And so I think um, th it's not necessarily a specific practice, like, oh, they did this specific thing. And like, oh, wow, that was, th there was no eureka moments with that. But I think the way they think about prioritizing, understanding the business. Uh, and I think, again, through the lens of a CPO, you know, they have to understand intimately the business objectives and the goals. They have to understand how the different functional from finance, marketing, go to market are enabling that. They have to build and adapt their people strategy to support all those functions and their roles enabling the business strategy. And they also have to understand the external environment and the things that are happening around uh, the company, either within the industry or within the, the world and geopolitical landscape and other things like that, that could be threats to the strategy that they have to adapt to. So it's it's an incredibly complex job to me next to the CEO. I think it's the hardest job in the C-suite for all those reasons. You have to understand, you see other functions in a really uh, deep way that you know most other functional executives don't necessarily need the same depth amongst their peers. What for, for anyone listening out there that might feel overwhelmed by what we're talking about, that's I feel overwhelmed talking about these <laughs> things. So that's a to totally normal feeling if you're feeling that way. But I, one of the, the most amazing parts of launching the Modern People Leader is being re-energized and just the hope that, that I've gotten through all the connections and conversations we've had. There is a genuine desire to help in our community. Community. And, and it's amazing how quickly, like these are people leading billion dollar companies and, you know, have all of the a never ending to do list. And when we've emailed some of these leaders, they've responded to us within within an hour, within minutes, sometimes wanting to help, you know, asking us like, hey, how can we help you? We we really want you, the modern people leader, to get the, these messages out there. What can we do to help you amplify that? And it's just such a, uh, it, it it's really is an amazing and beautiful thing. Um, and I just wanted to share that because sometimes, you know, so you're telling me I need to master the business. You're telling me I need to also invest more time in networking, which for some personalities, like I'm an extroverted introvert like that. I'm half willing to sign up for that. And, you know, there's the day job as well. But in my experience, there's like so much help to get through all of these, all of these things that, you know, it's not as daunting as it may seem. Yeah, no, I think you're, I think you're spot on. And I think, again, look at, look at, you know, look at LinkedIn, right. Over the last, you know, a couple of months, right. We, we, we went from like our feeds being flooded with new job announcements to our feeds being flooded with layoffs and layoff lists. And to see how the, the field and the community has rallied around each other and has kind of worked to support other people and amplify individuals, amplify layoff lists, uh, offer resume writing tips. There's just, there's so many examples of people who are, are stepping up in difficult moments to help others in the industry. And it's been, I agree with you, like it's been so amazing to watch that and to realize that that is pretty special and, and unique. And I think particularly in difficult times, seeing the way the field is kind of coalesced around others and trying to be helpful and supportive um, has been awesome. So I think that, you know, that's definitely something when you look at the future of the field, right. And going back to your earlier point around like that legacy mindset and not sharing, it shows you how far we've come from those days. And so when you think about, next year I, i'm i'm sure that the change isn't gonna it's not gonna slow down at all i'm sure it's gonna be just as chaotic as 2022 is there anything that's that's keeping you up at night when you think about about next year um i mean i think the biggest thing is just the you know obviously the macroeconomic uh uncertainty and where that's gonna because that impacts everything right it impacts investment in HR programs. It impacts investment in team growth and development, um, hiring, right? Like all of these things that, you know, I think we, we've made a lot of progress as a field over the last couple of years in some of these areas, but largely because they were also funded. You know, we had budget. These things take investment. They take, they take capital. And so how much will this economic uncertainty 
uh, hamper, curtail, and restrict some of the progress we've made in other areas like DEIB and remote work and employee experience and mental health and just some of the things that I think we've we've made some some good developments with over the last couple of years. Are, are those going to be either frozen or worse, they get a backslide based on you know the uncertainty of the economy creating budgetary restrictions. Uh, and I think we will see that in Q1 because I think they're, everybody's still kind of waiting to see what's going to happen. Uh, you know, hopefully that begins to open up more on a quarterly basis as the year progresses. But, you know, that's the biggest unknown because ultimately that impacts everything. Yeah. I, in my experience in times like these, that, that legacy mindset that we keep talking about thrives and it, and it wants to, it wants to, to have a solution, <laughs> a definitive solution. And so the, the default mindset is like, well, we need to do what we've done in the past. Um, that, that's my fear is that that's kind of how some of these things, the mechanics start in terms of the progress on things like diversity, equity, inclusion, and remote working. That's where I believe, that's where I think the risk could start is we start to see more of the legacy mindset, uh, start setting in again. And, you know, some of the things get unwound, but I do believe, and I I believe it was Julia Sofa on that we had that we just we had a conversation with that some of these these we've made enough progress in, in some of these areas that I I I believe that we you, we can't unwind all of that like it just will be too difficult for companies at this point their employer brands will seriously be at risk in my mind if they if they try to unwind some of the things but. I can see that they're they're definitely that keeps me up at, at night as well. Just seeing uh, the the us losing momentum on some of these really important things. As yeah. far as as far as um, you know, the look forward to to twenty twenty three. Do you think that what do you think the 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 recovery landscape or the the economic landscape? What are you are you getting any signals from your clients in terms of like what? what we should prepare for or you know is there a general consensus around like what what the the landscape will look like next year there's most definitely not a consensus right i think everybody and it also depends on where you sit like if you look at the the recent bureau of labor, labor statistics in the us like that you know hiring and growth is still high uh right like if you work in tech and you know i know tech can be a bubble and i'm in that bubble so like i have to really work to get outside of it sometimes and get a perspective outside of that um, but yeah, I was working on my, uh, my annual kind of year end wrap up, uh, piece for fast company around like, uh, seven ways HR will look different in the new year. And so I was starting to look into some of the statistics, um, and like, yes, tech has been hit pretty hard, but other industries are, you know, either not hit hard and some are thriving. So on balance, we're actually, you know, it's not as doom and gloom as it may feel if we work in tech. And so I think that, you know, I, I don't know, I'm certainly not an economist and I can't make any of those predictions. I, I think most companies are probably going into Q1 conservatively and cautiously so that they have, you know, if things do tighten, they're prepared for that. If they don't and or, and or they open, they're also prepared for that. But I expect people will be cautious for Q1, probably into Q2 as well, uh, hopefully with a, a beginning to see that upswing in Q3 and Q4. Um, but yeah, time will tell. I think one of the interesting developments of this is, you know, I, I think we're going to see more people who typically have worked in tech moving to other industries that are viewed to be more stable, um, right? Which I think will be really interesting. And it is one of the pieces I covered in that Fast Company article is that I, I think we're going to see more people who, you know, typically they move from kind of startup to startup saying, you know what, you know, maybe, maybe this isn't what I need to be doing right now. Maybe I just want to go somewhere and like have roots for a couple of years, especially with the uncertainty around the economy. And I think with that, it'll be interesting to see how some of the, uh, the ways the, you know, oftentimes I'm generalizing, but you know, tech startup companies tend to be pretty progressive on the HR side. If we start to bring infuse some of those practices into some more traditional organizations, that that's going to have an elevating effect in some of those companies that maybe, you know, were, were maybe more on the legacy side of the spectrum uh, and then elevating their capabilities. I think that'll be an interesting thing to watch in 2023. 
So you have worked with some of, and I, I don't know if they're like partnerships or just, you know, these are friends that you've, you've been involved with, but you've been exposed to some of the like most cutting edge technologies in the HR space. And I, I was surprised to hear one of the questions we ask, and, and we'll ask you a similar question is, if you could change one thing, what would it be? And we, we had a run of, it was either three or four chief people officers that said HR tech is not where it needs to be. The, the HR technology is just not, it's still not, it's gotten better, but it's still not doing the things that we need to do at scale. And so I'm just, I know you have a lens into the, the HR tech space as well. And so just curious your thoughts on that that comment or that perspective and um, you know, any, any interesting insights that you have on, on where you think the HR tech space could be heading because the HR cycles, I feel like we're coming out of one HR tech cycle in which, you know, 2015, 2016, there was a lot of investment. Then there was a lot of growth and there's been a flurry of acquisitions and activity the last couple of years. So, so just curious, curious to get your thoughts there. Yeah. I mean, I think the space as a whole is, pretty saturated. You know, if you go back to 2021, even, you know, the for Q1 and Q2 of this year, the amount of venture capital being poured into the HR tech space was off the charts, record-breaking. We'd never seen that level of investment in the space. And I think a lot of the venture capitalists were enamored with this idea of the new world of work and how do we support that? And it requires new tools and new platforms for remote work and just all the different things that we're doing now. And so again, they saw an opportunity for returns. They poured a ton of money into the space. We saw a lot of new companies come up. And what's interesting is I think a lot of the platforms you've seen that have come up are platforms that weren't necessarily designed by HR people for HR people, right? They're, they're designed by people who are capitalists who see an opportunity in a market and they want to seize it. And some of those turn out to be great products, but others don't really solve the problem that we need to be solved, or they don't have somebody who is well-versed in the realities of like the people doing that work and what they really need to be able to build for that need specifically. It's like, well, I think you need this. It's like, well, that's great. But what I really need is this. And so I think there's a bit of a disconnect in what's being funded and built and what is actually being requested and needed by the space. And so I just think, uh, you know, for anybody listening from the HR tech world, like, make sure at a very early stage, like prototyping stage, seed stage, that you're getting input from operators who will ultimately be the buyers and users of your product. And that is shaping your roadmap. If you're building in a vacuum and you're getting to like MVP product and even beyond that, and and you haven't run this by like deeply people who are going to be the end users, you may be building not for need at all. So I think it's really important that you do that. So there isn't this disconnect of like all these things being built that aren't really things that we need. And in this environment now, where, as we mentioned, like the budgetary constraints that are happening, it's going to be harder to get those dollars uh, from the, unless you're really helping solve a problem and make their lives easier or better or more efficient on some level. So I think that has to drive your product roadmap. Yeah, it's selling to the HR buyer is, I think anyone that's been in sales and has touched this space would would agree that it is it, it can be extremely challenging. And now we've got budgets are tightening. <laughs> and uh, and and I do believe also that for it can be very difficult for startups to sell, just given how much money some of the the big competitors are pouring in. Like the the tactics that we use in 2015 just like we can never we can never even attempt those now because things like uh, SEM paid cert like those sorts of channels like are 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 being dominated by the big players because they have the big budgets to go along with that and so I think that also just makes it really hard to uh, in addition to you know how you're approaching the the product development itself um, and, you know I I just view it very difficult I don't know what your thoughts are Daniel you've spent more time marketing and selling uh, than, than I have. Yeah, it's tough. I, I think at least right now, if if you're not selling a necessity, then it's a tough sell. And 
I know every company thinks that that they're a painkiller and uh, not just a vitamin. But if you're not able to clearly articulate why you're a painkiller in like five seconds, then there's a good chance that you're going to get cut from the budget. That's just that's just my view. So, yeah, if you're if you're thinking about building, you know, the next HR tech product, think about building a product that regardless of the economic environment is going to be a stable business because people absolutely need it. Like Slack. Companies aren't getting rid of Slack. Um, ADP or, you know, products like that. Like nobody's getting rid of that. Like there's there's just certain categories that are absolutely essential. So I think that's the most important thing. Yeah, and look, I think, you know, if you can succeed in a down market, you're going to thrive in a regular market, right? So I think the yeah, companies, you know, as we, as we enter this period, whatever, you know, whatever, whatever the impact and whatever the length of the impact is going to be, um, you know, companies that, that aren't solid there, they're not going to make it through it, right? And I think we'll see a lot of, especially because there was so much investment in HR tech the last couple of years, I think we'll see a lot of those companies, you know, go away if they can't quickly find that market fit and that value prop. But those that can, and those that are well positioned and are still able to grow in a, 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 a constrained market, um, I think they'll really thrive as the economy kind of, you know, strengthens again. So you mentioned you mentioned earlier about the the piece with Fast Company, the seven ways HR will look different in 2023. Is there anything that we we haven't covered already that uh, you want to share with our audience? Um, you know, we hit a few of the pieces. Um, I, you know, I won't I won't hit all of them. By the time this runs, the article will be live, so people can uh, yeah. can check that out. But I think uh, you know one one of the pieces that was two pieces that were fun to write about. Um, one is just. You know, if you've been following the the saga over Twitter and this notion of, you know, Twitter 2.0 hardcore and some of the VCs kind of lauding that approach, uh, you know, one of the points I made is that, you know, hardcore is not a long-term talent strategy. And I think that, again, there, there is this nostalgia for that hustle and grind culture, especially in tech and startup land at the CEO level and certainly at the VC level because they saw higher returns that way that just doesn't exist anymore. And, and I think there will be some people that are like, Hey, let's just do it lean and scrappy and it'll be cool. People can sleep in the office. Like you can do that. You're the CEO, but you're not going to have a very easy time attracting anything, but like recent graduates who just want to have your company on their resume. So I, I think that was one piece. And then the other is I'm sure uh, many of your listeners by now have seen, you know, open AI and chat GPT uh, and what's come out of that. And I, I I'm, super intrigued by that as a tool that we can leverage in HR, um, you know, less on maybe the Dolly visual side, more on like the writing chat GPT side, but the ability to use this and it's not going to do our writing for us. So I'm sure some people will use it to do their writing for them, but can help us research and, and maybe get unstuck from creative projects or think about new ways of doing things. And I, I'm excited to see the creativity that that will unlock in 2023. And I mean, to the point of you know, job descriptions, right? Like job descriptions is usually terrible, right? You can say like, write a job description for a product manager in the style of a sea shanty, right? And just like, yes, it's fun. It's whimsical. It's not compliant. So if you work in a compliance organization, like that can't be your job description. This is more <laughs> of like an advert. So don't, that's legal advice. But the ability to like, just, just have fun and do some really creative things. I think it'll be interesting to see how HR teams specifically leverage tools like that in the new year. And I kind of weighed in like, so, you know, the ability to, you know, you, the output from a platform like that is based on how well your request is and how well you can write your request and how specific it can be. But I think that will become an art for some people in HR who are really good at writing a really good script that, pr that produces a great piece of content and output. And so I, I, I'm intrigued to see that. I also think the downside of that is that we're probably going to see, you know, we're already in this environment where there's so much content that's being out put out there right now. I, we will see some people who will just rely on platforms like this to write blog posts or LinkedIn posts. And so I think we're going to, you know, be flooded with even more content. That's the downside of this, but I'm, I'm more interested in how HR uses it from a, a creativity and a writing standpoint. Yeah, I uh so my my wife is a machine learning engineer and last last week we went to her holiday party 
and it's a team of nothing but ML engineers. So everyone is talking about ChatGPT, and uh, I've been playing around with it, and it's fun. And I think what will be interesting is not the people who use tools like ChatGPT to write their blog posts, but the people who use these tools to sort of complement what they're already doing to make it even more creative. Like I'm like, how can I, you know, what's what's like a a, a LinkedIn you know, like weekly recurring posts that I could do where I'm incorporating something from chat GPT, not having it do everything for me, but doing something fun that I can then add my own creativity to, whether it's generating a random image from open AI and then writing a post about it or a post that sort of makes sense that goes with it. I feel like that's really interesting. And then the other thing that you said is how people may try to lean into this hustle grind culture because of Twitter 2.0. And this, this topic like fires me up. So one of, uh, one of my friends, she, she works for a big tech company and recently she got a new boss and new boss comes in and he's essentially trying to bring in his own team and he's pushing people out by, uh, trying to instill this hustle culture. And if people aren't going to buy in, then he's telling them that they basically need to accept severance. And she was saying that everyone wants to leave, like that it, immediately when he came in, it became a toxic culture. Yeah. And I, I feel like all it takes is one bad apple like that coming into a company. And all of a sudden, you know, you've lost five, six employees People don't have a tolerance for that anymore. And anytime I hear about something like that, it just fires me up. Yeah. I mean, I think your, you know, second to last point hit it. Like people don't have a tolerance for that for, and you don't, you have options, right? So it's not like, you know, if you, you know, and again, CEOs are, they can run their company any way they want. Um, but the way they run it will have repercussions on their ability to attract and retain talent. So I, I think what's great is, we're in this environment now where there's so many different options, right? If you want to go into an office five days a week, plenty of companies where you can do that. If you never want to go into an office, plenty of companies you can do that. If you want to do something in between, plenty of companies where you can do that. So really this idea of choice is I think one of the lasting benefits of all the turmoil we've been through the last couple of years. And like, yes, some companies will make, you know, proclamations of having to be in an office X days a week. That's fine. They can do that, but many others won't. And so whatever, whatever it is that, you're you're interested in there will be those types of opportunities and I, I want to acknowledge like there's definitely privilege in that statement that not all employees have the ability to kind of move jobs and not all fields are as in demand where you know you could do that so let's you know call that what it is um, but for people that are in those types of roles uh, you know they will have options uh, they'll have the ability to um, to go and find an environment that best aligns with what their needs are whatever their needs are. One hope I have for 2023 is, and this is circling back, I, I was going to jump in, but the conversation earlier, but the conversation went a different direction. And uh, it's going back to, Lars, your point on agility. And, and one hope that I have for 2023 is we see more HR teams and companies approaching a more agile agile practices in, in HR. And I think that that's uh, a challenge. <laughs> you know, I think th this... Agility, agile HR was, I feel like a buzzword, you know, a few years ago, maybe longer now. And uh, I think it failed just due to, it was too early in my opinion, given all the legacy stuff we talked about. Um, but there's so many companies that I feel like, like, for example, my partner, she works in a, a 12,000 employee company in the, uh, in the, the high tech space. And they, they required everyone in HR to take agile training. But then they were given no context in terms of how or, or guidance or instructions and in, into how you actually take these principles and apply them to your day job. And they're just spinning their wheels. They uh, they are right now just locked in these year in processes, these kind of waterfall things that they've always done. And uh, it was like, wait a second, did you guys all just take an H uh, <laughs> agile HR training course? And, and I think... It, my point there is that I think it's needed. Like there, there needs to be a better way to adopt these these principles, um, so that we can 
function better and better serve the companies that 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 we are we're working for. And so that to me is a hope in in 2023 more than any sort of insider prediction. Um, but yeah, I think we've made progress, but it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Yeah, and just to uh, you know, plant a seed for the listeners uh, on a book that was going to be coming out later this year. Um, it's called Built for People. It's by Jess Swan. Um, she's a COO of Whereby, um, but has a background in HR prior to that. And the whole book is about, um, and she's been writing about this for years, like how you take product management principles and use them in HR to design HR programs and strategies. So again, it gets into agile, it gets into user testing, you know, so many different things that are that are core disciplines in product management, but rarely cross over into HR. And it's a whole book that is is a roadmap for like how to bring those principles and that way of thinking and working into HR. And so I think I agree with you completely on agile. I think that the, the resources like that um, will be really helpful for for us who you know work in the field, but maybe hadn't ever had an opportunity to take an agile course or, uh, you know, work in other functions and embrace that kind of, uh, you know, thinking and design. Well, Lars, unfortunately we're at that point in the conversation where we need to, we need to start wrapping things up. I, you're, you're right. I feel like we could, we could, this is one of those conversations we can, can easily continue for another hour, but we, we have a ritual, a couple of rituals before we wrap up with the modern people leader. And so I want to go into our rapid fire questions, the same set of questions we ask every guest. And my first question for you is, how do you define a modern people leader? What are the traits and characteristics? Um, well, I wrote a book on this, so I'll try to, uh, I'll try to keep it short. I mean, uh, proactive, compassionate, strategic, curious, I think I'd I could keep going, but I'm sure in the interest of rapid fire, uh, I should not. So I'll leave it at that. And, and plug for Lars's book. If <laughs> if you want to yeah. learn, if you want more of his insight, read the book. Next question. If you could go back in time and talk to a 22-year-old Lars, what career advice would you give yourself and why? Um, probably to trust the process. You know, I think as a 22-year-old, I didn't know what the hell I was going to do. Like I was, I studied marketing international business in college uh, the only reason I fell into recruiting is because I wanted to move to LA and we had one company that came to our career fair at Florida state that had a comp had an office in LA and they happened to be a technical recruiting firm. So I'm like, I have no idea what that is, but it'll get me to LA. So I, I, I took that. And I think there was, you know, a period that was during the dot-com 1.0 days. So it was great to be an agency recruiter. Then it sucked to be an agency recruiter when the Not bubble so burst, uh, you know, and I was like, do I still do this? Do I do something else? And um, I think I, you know, I stuck with it. I ended up going to a client that got funding and then Ticketmaster. And it was like, you know, I think, you know, you, well, another piece I'd probably say as well is like, think of your career in two year increments, one to two year in increments. Don't go deeper than that because you're going to miss opportunities if you try to have like a five year plan and you, you find yourself deviating from that plan in one to two year increments and trust the process. Love both of those. If you could fix any HR people problem with a magic wand, what would it be? Uh, the way we approach diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Love yeah, it. I think that is. Yeah, yeah, that's got to be a top three. <laughs> One that we've heard. We need to do a, a a debrief on all of the uh, the magic wand responses, but I know that would would definitely be at the top. Yeah, yeah, I mean, look, we have we have so much work to do there, but we have to also realize that the work starts with us individually. And if we're not willing to do that work ourselves individually, we have no chance of impacting the organization. And so I think that really that that's a kind of call to action for all of us, all of your listeners, myself included, um, to continue to be committed to that work. Yeah. I can't remember who said this on the show, but somebody said that the future of work is DEIB. It's, it revolves around that. Yeah. All right. So a couple of last questions. So who would you nominate for us to bring onto the show next? Like if we had to just have one or two guests, who who do you think we need to have on? Um, I mean, there's so many people in the space that I <laughs> admire, so it's hard for me to nail that down. And I know and some yeah. of these people you may have already had, but like I, you know, when I think about the the people who if I could clone them, right, as a CPO, uh, you know, they they would have a mix of people like Katie Burke at HubSpot, Katarina Berg 
as Spotify, uh, right? Just progressive, embracing open source, humble, smart, super savvy around all the things they need to be, always open to learn and and be curious. I think those are the traits of high impact CPOs and, and they have them in abundance. We're gonna have to reach out to Katarina Berg. All right, so on to our last ritual of the modern people leader. We do a one word or phrase close where we respond with a word or phrase from the episode. It could be anything. And I'll go first because I already wrote mine down. Mine is 2023. And, and just to be clear, is this, is this a word that we've uh, we've covered uh, in the podcast or just like a, a general word? I want to make sure it I'm, could I'm, be... I'm giving you what you need. It could be just like general sentiment coming out of this episode. It could be a word that you feel like sums up what we talked about. Yeah. Or it could be totally random. Whatever yeah. pops p- pops into your mind. Uh, I'm going to go growth. I think Love growth it. applies to so much of what we're talking, uh, what our focus needs to be in 2023. Um, and it touches so many areas that uh, I think you need to be. So yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold on to that one, growth. Yeah, and I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with agility. Um, as soon as that you said that, Lars, it just really resonated with me. And I think you know, again, looking forward, it's we're gonna need to be agile. The I think the only certain thing is that there's gonna be more change and more disruption. Uh, so we're gonna need to be agile. All right. So but, if I combine all three, it's growth and agility for 2023. Hey, 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 there you go. Look at you. <laughs> I like it. I like it. You, you didn't even spoken like a true you marketer. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that didn't even come from ChatGPT, man. You, uh, that was that was uh, an original. Yeah, I'm sure it would have come up with something a little bit stranger. Yeah, yeah, maybe not appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> well, right. Lars, this was a, a an idea. Well, shout out to CR for for suggesting yeah. this. Um, we had her on the show a few months ago, and we were like, of course, we would love to if Lars is down to do it. And so thank you so much for being open to to join us on on the pod. It's been a lot of fun chatting with you, and hopefully you, you'd you be open to coming back someday. Yeah, for sure. Like you said, I, mean, I think we probably left an hour on the table uh, yeah, we somewhere, did, sure. so we should regroup in the new year. Uh, well, this runs in the new year. We should regroup <laughs> later this year. Right. That's, that's the podcaster dilemma when you're recording at the end of the year and it's like, this is going to run like, uh, yeah, right. this is going to run in the future. So yeah. So later this year we should regroup, we should track, uh, you know, where we are progress we've made and, uh, hopefully, uh, be celebrating the, uh, the upswing of the economy that is, uh, unlocking any of these programs that might get locked up a bit in Q1. Done. Sure. Would love to do that. All right, awesome. guys, have a great holiday. Happy new yeah. year. You as well. Thanks. And uh, again, thanks for having these conversations and continuing to uh, help propel us all forward. So keep it up. It's great work. Thank Likewise. You. Okay. All right, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.